Well, grace, peace, and love to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Jesus Christ, the King of glory and the Savior of souls. Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us forever adored. In a day and age when people are seeking guidance and direction, hope and meaning, the wisdom of God is rarely considered. People step up left and right and boast of a wisdom that really is no wisdom at all. And even in the church, wisdom from above is, dare I say, overlooked. And how can this be, especially, especially in the church? I mean, this is the issue that James is speaking to, and it's one that I believe weighs very heavy on his heart. For a wisdom claimed not from God is a destructive wisdom and will definitely unravel the ministry of a church. So it's how appropriate that today that we swim in these waters this morning on Christ the King Sunday and consider the wisdom from our forever reigning King. May the church not forget who we serve and from whom we owe our existence. Let's pray. Holy and awesome God, you sent Jesus Christ, the King, to save us, to redeem us, to reign, the head of the church, the head of the body, oh God. It behooves us to look to him for our guidance, for wisdom, how often do we try to go it alone? How often do we try to figure things out on our own, thinking we know the way? May we look to you, O oh God. May we ask for this wisdom from you. For it's only through you can we properly glorify you. So guide me now, O oh God, as I preach this word. May they be yours. May I be faithful to the text. May I not seek my own glory, the glory of anybody or anything else, but seek yours to bring glory to your name. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and redeemer. Amen. As I said, we are going to continue here in chapter 3. We're going to be finishing off these last few verses in chapter 3. And then we're going to be taking a little break from James as we get into Advent. We're going to be spending some time in some Advent texts in the Gospel of Matthew. So um, we've got a couple of chapters here. We'll get back to James here. But um, with Advent coming, we're going to move into that starting next week. So chapter 3 will be done here today. So let's get to verse 13 as James deals with an issue here in the church dealing with wisdom. And he, asks, he starts out with a question. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works and the meekness of wisdom. Who is wise and understanding among you? Hopefully nobody was very quick to answer that question. Because it's one of those questions that James is going to slap your hand down. Because what, what James does here in the following verses is puts... Anybody who would answer that question too quickly puts them in their place by describing a couple different kinds of wisdom. You see, anyone who is not wise and understanding will raise their hand if they think they really are wise and understanding. You see how that works? So I'm hoping nobody raised their hand in their heads here. For a truly wise person doesn't really realize it, or they don't have to say anything. They don't have to tell people. But as James says, it's shown through their good conduct. By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness, in the meekness of wisdom. You see how that works. A wise person is grounded in a proper fear of the Lord. That's where it begins. Proper fear of the Lord. And we know the many verses, especially in the Proverbs, that deal with wisdom. Proverbs 1.7, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Fools despise godly wisdom and instruction, but seek after 
their own. And we'll talk about that in a second. Proverbs 9, 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We know that one. And the knowledge of the Holy One is inside. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So it begins with this proper fear of the Lord. And so a truly wise person understands this and swims in this truth. When someone truly fears the Lord, then meekness results because they understand their place in the created order. Meekness. Not weakness, meekness. Gentleness. Humbleness. Truly wise person doesn't see them as wise, like I, like I mentioned. It's almost like saying, hey, I'm a humble person. That very admission negates one's humility, doesn't it? Just like the whole wisdom thing. I'm a wise person. You just negated that whole thing. A wise person shouldn't have to say anything, right? And we know wise people in our lives. Real, I mean, godly, wise people, I think you know people, they're not running around bragging about it, are they? They're not wearing a sign. They're not posting things on social media. I'm a wise person, come and talk to me. They're not doing that. A meek person doesn't brag about wisdom. A truly wise person knows the good and knows how to do it that brings glory to God. A wise person is submissive. That's what a meek person does. You understand your place in the created order, therefore you submit to God. So a truly wise person knows that, submits to God, and does what God commands. All this is to say that a truly wise person is only wise because wisdom comes from God, not from them. If it comes from them, that's where the bragging and boasting comes. You know, look at my knowledge, look at what I can do kind of thing. Verse 14, James continues here, But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. So two aspects of this. You know, if you've got bitter jealousy and selfish ambition, those two qualities are the antithesis of godly wisdom. Those two things do not appear in godly wisdom. So the very godly people that you know in your life, I'm willing to bet there's no bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in them. Okay? Right? Am I, am I right so far? Those godly, those wise people that you know in your life? It's interesting. The Greek word for selfish ambition, it's, 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 a, it's a rare word, but you go to some other sources outside the Bible, it refers to greedy politicians seeking to achieve their agendas at all costs. Now, I know we, don't, we don't, can't relate to that at all in our day and age, right? It's interesting that, that that's the word. Greedy politicians seeking to achieve selfish ambition. That's what James is pointing to. If you have bitter jealousy, selfish ambition, claiming to be wise basically mocks God because the wisdom doesn't come from God. See how that works? Boasting in this false wisdom misrepresents the truth. He says, don't, don't boast about this. If you have this in your heart, don't boast. And so it's almost like James is encouraging, admonishing the church, examine your hearts. Examine your hearts. If what you're doing is from bitter jealousy and selfish motives don't misrepresent the truth, but yet it happens in the church. We, we know many, especially like celebrity preachers and pastors out there, how they're misrepresenting the truth. Wisdom from God only seeks the glory of God. Only seeks the glory of God. Bitter jealousy, selfish ambition. That's not seeking God's glory. Any other glory is a clear indication that the wisdom is not from God, Right? So what does this ungodly wisdom really look like? Well, James describes this, the, the nature of this ungodly wisdom. So in verse 15, he lays this out here. Three different descriptions. This wisdom here that he described in verse 14, he says, is not a, is not a wisdom that comes down from above. So bitter jealousy, selfish ambition, not from God. Okay? Doesn't come from him. But... It is earthly, unspiritual, 
demonic. Those three descriptions. So let's take them in turn here. Earthly, what are we referring to? It, it doesn't take the revealed will of God into account. So if you think of something earthly, in wisdom in this quality, it's weak, it's limited, it's short-sighted. It doesn't see the whole picture. For an example, how many of you have read the classic Moby Dick? Anyone read Moby Dick? A few people? I've never read it. I, I've, I've had the Cliff Notes before. Do you know what the Cliff Notes are? I, I relied on those a lot when I was in high school. I didn't read a whole lot. <laughs> I wrote papers based on Cliff Notes to make it look like I actually knew what I was talking about. And I got away with it for the most part. And I, I, I portrayed a knowledge of a subject that I really didn't have any knowledge about. I know there's a whale in Moby Dick. I know there's a Captain, Captain Ahab, I believe. He's obsessed about this whale. That's about all I know. But if I were to get the cliff notes, I could probably kind of snow you over about how much I really, well, make you think I know something, but I don't. Earthly wisdom it, it, it sounds good, and, and some people are really good at convincing you that they have wisdom, but it's really short-sighted. It, it's limited. It doesn't know the big picture. They're just working off Cliff's notes, and that's it. It, it. it can only take them so far, and those who are truly wise see through that pretty quickly. The few hands that have read Moby Dick, if I started talking about it through Cliff notes, you probably figure it out pretty quickly that I really don't know what I'm talking about. Next, James says this ungodly wisdom is unspiritual. The Greek word here, and I'm not going to pronounce it quite correctly, but you might hear the English word that we get from it is psychikos. It's where we get the word psyche. So unspiritual, psyche, dealing with human reason, thought, or feelings. So this wisdom that's not from God, it's focused on this, this self-centered kind of wisdom. It's, it's, it's for personal gain. So you're focused on what you feel and what you think. And, that, and that's what it's all about. Not only is it short-sighted and limited, doesn't see the whole picture, but this ungodly wisdom is selfish, self-centered. How does it make me feel? and trying to lead people to get people to do things that you want them to do to make you feel better. It's the kind of wisdom that James is trying to describe here. It expresses a way of life centered upon the dictates of the selfish mind and heart, another description that a commentator wrote. And that's the unspiritual. Anything that's just it's definitely not from God. And we've seen this before. We've seen this in many leaders, that are leading from the, this, this vantage point. And then James goes into the third one, which is demonic. Now he's really hitting home here and driving this home here. And basically demonic is direct opposition to God. Anything demonic is directly opposed to God because it doesn't seek God's glory. It doesn't seek God's glory. Glory. So basically, this ungodly wisdom is it's a very limited, short-sighted wisdom geared towards personal gain that's directly opposed to God. If you want to really break that down, how James is laying this out. Okay? And how many times have we seen that kind of wisdom in the church? It appears in the church. When you put it that, when you, when you describe it like this, you can see how this wisdom can be very destructive in a church, right? Very destructive. Because the result of it, verse 16. Verse 16 is the result of this ungodly wisdom. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. Disorder, chaotic frenzy or fighting, vile practice, good for nothing. Accomplishing nothing that advances the kingdom. We've seen that in the church. There's never any fighting in the church, right? When there is chaotic frenzy and fighting in the church, they obviously are not coming together to seek the wisdom of God, right? 
They're seeking their own wisdom. You see how that works. Or they're being led by a person who's, who's quick to answer that question from verse 13. Yes, I'm wise. Follow me. Listen to me. I know the right way for the church to go. When the church seeks wisdom that's not from God, you get disorder, double-mindedness, double talk. Nothing good is going to come from it. In the long run, the church is in trouble. And it's no wonder James is concerned about this. It's no wonder James is concerned about this. I mean, I'm not preaching this because I'm concerned about this church as we move into a new ministry setting. But you can see how this could crop up. Well, we should do things this way. Believe me, I have all this experience. Can you imagine if that started happening? I mean, we'd be done before we started out there. Done. This is why we're seeking. We spent all this time seeking the wisdom of God. What do we do about this? I mean, as I thought about this, if we were to logically consider what we were supposed to do in Graham, we probably wouldn't have done it. But when we seek God's wisdom, it was so clear, at least to me and I think for many others who I've talked to, this is what God is up to, even though it may not make sense in some ways. But God's wisdom doesn't always make sense. God's wisdom is always right, though. It behooves us to seek God's wisdom in everything. But then in verse 17, but... The godly wisdom. The wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. Right there. Wisdom from God is pure and sincere. Pure and sincere. The only thing pure is God. Sincere, it's, it's true. God, the wisdom from God is absolutely 100% and more pure and true. And this describes the nature of the wisdom. Now, in between that bookend of pure and sincere are some qualities, maybe some external qualities that people will notice in the one who is godly wisdom. So the people in your life who you consider people with godly wisdom, I'm willing to bet these qualities come to mind peaceable, right? This is key, what we're going to see in verse 18. They're gentle, right? Gentle people. Open to reason. Open, ready to listen, but not compromise what they believe. Full of mercy. Full of mercy. Good fruits. Well, that just makes sense. If you've got godly wisdom, the the fruit of the Spirit is going to come out. Just read Galatians 5, 22 to 23. Good fruits. Impartial. I mean, that's, that's godly wisdom that's going to come out from people that have this. And that's what you need, especially when we're dealing with the unknown here and where God's leading us. I mean, that's godly wisdom. Churches and leaders that exhibit this will not be in chaotic frenzy and fighting. There won't be disorder. Thus, we need to ask for wisdom. We need to ask for it. James chapter 1, verse 5, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. Did you hear that? If you lack wisdom, ask God, and he's going to give it. Not just give, but give generously. That's That's awesome. Or consider Solomon. I love Solomon. A young man leading Israel. God says, ask for anything. This young man could have asked for the death of his enemies, riches, and all this stuff. Selfish gain, that kind of stuff. He could have asked for it, and God would have just given it to him, right? Right? But instead, he asked for a discerning mind that he could lead this people. It's a great people. How can I properly lead this people of yours, God, without a discerning mind, without wisdom? Right? And God was pleased he asked for this. And then he gave them 
what he didn't ask for, what he could have asked for, but didn't. Because he had the right mind to deal with all that stuff he didn't ask for. He asked for a discerning mind. This church is too great for any one person to lead with their own gifts. We need to ask for wisdom to lead this great people of God. When we seek wisdom from above, we are given seeds to sow that bring about God's glory. This is ultimately ultimately what the church is about, isn't it? Coming together to advance the kingdom through the gospel of Jesus Christ, crucified and raised for sinners for the forgiveness of our sins. We are sinners. We are forgiven. And we are to come together to proclaim that, to advance the kingdom. This church cannot be led by ungodly wisdom. Thus, we need help. God, help us do what we need to do in Graham. I don't know what that is, but God will give that wisdom. We keep asking for it. We can't glorify God through our own self-created deeds. Remember Ephesians 2.10? Good works prepared beforehand. We can't glorify God unless we are given the works from God to glorify him. Thus, we can't glorify God unless we're given the wisdom from God to advance his kingdom, right? It just makes sense. If wisdom only comes from him, Solomon asked God for wisdom to lead God's people the way God wanted it. It behooves us to do the same. And then verse 18 wraps up the result of godly wisdom. Okay, we got the result of ungodly wisdom in verse 16. Now, verse 18 is the result of godly wisdom. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. When godly wisdom is employed, a harvest of righteousness will result. A harvest sown through peace, not chaotic, frenzy, fighting, and disorder. How can you expect peace to come out of disorder? That doesn't make sense. You can't hate people and show them the love of Jesus. You can't be divided and show the world unity in Christ. You can't put people down and try to lift them up. Salt water and fresh water cannot come from the same spring. Do you follow this? If you're going to be the church, then be the church. If you're not going to act like a church, then don't claim to be the church. Being false to the truth, misleading people, yet that's what we see. I saw an article this morning that just saddened me. A church claiming to be the church, but really not the church. Being false to the truth. And it saddens me that that's out there. The kingdom, for the kingdom of God to advance the way God wants, not what, how we want it, not according to strategies from experts, but the way God wants it to advance, His wisdom needs to be sought out. Not degrees or things like that. His wisdom. Anything else is short-sighted, flawed, selfish, demonic. If we're going to glorify God in Graham, we must always seek the wisdom that's from above. So let us ask for wisdom. Knowing that God will be happy to give it that we may glorify God through the ministry he has given us. Let us ask for wisdom and expect to receive it. Not just, I hope God hears my prayer, I hope God gives me that. Expect to receive it. Listen. Let us ask for wisdom that we may praise him always and forever. And all God's children said, Amen.